Hey guys, welcome into another episode of From the Wing. I'm Christian Clark, the Pelicans beat writer for NOLA.com and the Times Picune. The Pelicans just wrapped up a three game road trip. Really nice win over the Los Angeles Clippers, then two not so nice losses against the Utah Jazz. Utah did not have Laurie Markinen in either game. Pelicans couldn't win Saturday on the second night of a back to back. Uh, no Zion. Zion returned Monday. They still could not get it done. We are going to get into the road trip. We're going to get to the starting uh, lineup. We're going to get into CJ McCollum's impending return. But first, Adam, I think you came up with a great idea. If only we had a time machine. I tweeted that I've gotten really into kettlebells lately. And you came up with the idea that Chuck Norris, instead of hawking barbells, should have just been hawking kettlebells with his face as like the ball part. Did I, did I have that right? Yes, that's it. He sells you the total gym. <laughs> but realistically, like the Chuck Norris kettlebell is what he should have been selling you. That's the real total gym. I think that's a winner. You know, if we could go back in time, and do that one. You know, if we if this was hot tub time machine uh, and, and we got in the hot tub time machine, like that would probably be my move. I, I honestly think that's a winner. Look, Chuck made plenty of money off the total gym. That infomercial has been running for multiple <laughs> decades. But what they sold the consumer was a myth you cannot just pull cords at an angle and and train strength train your entire body however you can take those damn kettlebells and you can move them around in in a variety of ways that can train your whole body and you can gain strength from that especially just so great for your core so great for your core great for joints great for mobility just getting you flexible loosening everything up just keeps you fluid you know we need that as we get old and geriatric like we we need that you need the mobility you need to extend the joints what do we talk about with uh with these big bodied nba players gotta expand you gotta open everything up you know i'm gonna have some cast this week in a bunch of different sizes i'm gonna have them shipped to uh zion williamson's home and i'll check in with him in a couple of months and see if he's opened the box uh <laughs> okay let's let's talk about this road trip a little bit um let's just start here with the final play of monday's game uh pelicans down to about 11 seconds left willie green draws up a play where he, he empties out the right side of the floor for zion uh you know zion kind of it seemed like he got the angle on his defender but but uh walker kessler came over and doubled zion had to kick it up top brandon ingram takes the dribble in and just misses the two. It was a, it was a decent look. And whenever there is like a, a final second play that doesn't work out in your team's favor, like it just gets endlessly dissected. Even if Hammered. it's, if it's like, you know, if it doesn't work out, if it's a good play, if it's a bad play, um, what did, what did you think about what Willie green drew up and the look the Pelicans got? Look, I think they knew and you know, going into it, that there's two players that could potentially touch the ball um i thought that you know and and ad kind of diagrammed it for folks like coming into that last play he said on the broadcast that you should be looking for zion to challenge the basket see what coverage he gets and play off that that's exactly what they did he gets it kind of between the wing and the corner goes immediately i had no problem with what the play was I thought the play was fine. I thought the play generated, ended up generating an open look and that it was just a little clumsy, a little off timed. Um, you know, I think there were some, some immediate like fast criticisms. I think the only real criticism is like who was on the floor for that play. I, I think there's like real honest questions to ask. I, I understand like you have Zion going toward the basket. You have BI on the other side of the court. He is, on the other side of the halfway mark. And that is just to take a potential defender out of the screen. You are, you are trying to take your, your one real spacer and pull as many defenders away from the basket as possible. Zion runs into a crowd. This whistle is not, was not one to, for Zion to just like run into those bodies and dare them to blow it. He wasn't getting that call all night. So why would you do it? He made a good pass to a great spot. But B.I. catches the ball on the move. He's running from half court to the top of the key. He kind of catches it at the defender. If you freeze frame it, you can pretend that he could get a three up. But he was getting a three up through a hard contest with a body on his knees and his feet were not set. There was not a three. He dribbles in. 
gets comfortable as fast as he can, and he gets up an open look, which in a late clock situation like that with defense set, ready to read and react, it was about as good a look as, as you were going to get. He doesn't make the shots a little difficult. The only thing, you know, you hope that he either catches it with his feet set and can immediately go, um, or that the play took a little bit longer to develop so that there's less of the clock to play with. But realistically, like, talk this out online a little bit with Schmidt and everybody. Like, Zion had to go fast. You love to talk it out online. I do. I do. I hate talking out online. Oh, I, it just, <laughs> it's, I'm in the moment. I want to talk about it right now, and then I want to forget it ever happened. Okay. Um, Because, I, I like, within 10 minutes, I'm never going to want to talk about this play again, other than right now. Okay, we're talking um, about it. So, what was your conclusion? So I, I thought the play was fine. I think it's really, really tough not to have Hawk out there. Um, just having he, the additional spacer. He was out there. He was in the opposite corners. From oh, Zion. he was in the wrong corner. Excuse me. He was okay. weak sided on Zion and Najee's out there. And Najee hadn't exactly, he had like the one weird devastating quarter, but hadn't exactly been shooting the lights out. Um, so it just, you know, you got, some some average shooters and hawk in a place where he can't really get the ball um and b i got an open look would you have liked him to dribble in a little bit farther sure uh but he did what was fluid to him he got his feet set he got up he got an open look he missed it and then yeah. it was just ping pong i i i didn't i didn't hate it i mean it didn't work out on the pelicans favor but i i didn't like it wasn't so bad that I was like, oh man, like this cost the Pelicans a chance to tie the game. Like you got Zion the ball in space. You know, he kind of got the edge on his defender. Uh, Walker Kessler, I thought was really good in help. Keontae George, if you watch that play closely, did a nice job too of, you know, Hawkins was running to the corner and Keontae George was smart enough to realize like, no, 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 not leaving this guy. Um, so like kind of a heady play by the rookie. That's the one guy you definitely don't want to leave. Uh, you know, if you're, the guy not guarding Zion Williamson um, with Brandon specifically. Like I, I think, yeah, I don't think he could have just like taken the catch and shoot three. It would have been heavily contested. I think if he was going to take a three, it could have been like pump fake dribble to the side. Like you see Jason Tatum does all the time, but it's not really a shot in Brandon's repertoire. Honestly, like he just doesn't, he doesn't take like those sidestep threes. It's not a shot. He has, he has really developed. Um, and you know, it was a, it was a decent look. And Brandon Ingram is shooting 51% on mid-range shots this year. Uh, he's he's really hitting them this year. So it was a decent look. Um, I was fine with the look they got. I mean, really, the, the story of that game was two things. It was the three-point shooting, um, and it was the free throws, too. I think the Pelicans missed seven free throws. Those were the two areas where the game was lost to me. The tough part is the combination of the two. Like I wouldn't harp on either one if the other one was good, but when you're not a three point shooting team and you don't have the shooters, you can't give up the free throws. Um, especially when, you know, Keontae George and friends are bombing. Um, Keontae George is a nice half, player, man. He's a nice player. Dude, I'm going to be so wrong about him. We talked about people in the draft and like, he was one of the guys that I was like, I watch him. I watched the, a few of the Baylor games and I just see a dude that's chucking. He's got high high usage, and he's just shooting everything. His shot selection was terrible in college. He was incredibly inefficient in college. Making him the primary ball handler, turning him into an NBA point guard, looks like it's going to work. He is not shoot first, and but he is not afraid to shoot either, and it's it's kind of exactly what he needed. I was shocked more by the defense. He was really working his butt off out there, and my fantasy team is thrilled with it. Um, you know, I may have had the the draft take about him, but in fantasy basketball, if a guy might fall into a starting role, you got to just go grab him and live with it. And uh, yeah, he looks like he had his his breakout games against New Orleans. It that's that's your starting point guard for Utah for the future. He looked great. Will, Will Hardy, by the way, uh, gave a, a great quote uh, in the past few days. If you're going to wear a Utah Jazz jersey, you have to give an S about the Utah Jazz. Uh, I thought that was great. I mean, the NBA has just become <laughs> its become so much about the individual. I think like some of the mentality of like we accomplish things as a team and we also lose as a team has been lost. I love that quote. Uh, Will Hardy seems like he's a pretty good coach. 35. 35 when we saw that lineup for the first game that opening lineup everybody looked at it like what they're 
tank mode. They're going to lose. They want to lose. And all the beat writers around Utah said, no, this is all the dudes that give a shit. Every one of these dudes is going to fight their ass off and cares about every minute they play. This is a message to everybody else. And he sent a message Here. to his team by like benching a bunch of guys in Saturday's game, like uh, Fontecchio getting the start, you know? Yeah. Fontecchio getting the double start. He didn't just get the show me start in the first game. He stayed out there. And unfortunately, the Pelicans left him open a lot. And yeah. uh, middle aged, middle aged, at least for basketball terms, middle aged Euros who've been pro for a long time. They make those shots. And that dude sat in the corner wide open pretty much all night. Um, the third pillar of how they lost this game, though, the defense has been gone for these two games. Hmm. The defense did not exist. Um, we, I was blown away by just how many horrific coverage mistakes we had, how many failed rotations. I was willing to kind of bless it away in the first Utah game. They're landing at 3 a.m. or whatever. You know, it's a... It's a weird back to back where you flew to Utah and like there's no Zion. You you kind of get being a little deflated and the shots and everything looked like it. Like they were short. Everybody was missing everything. It was the third and fourth rotation that was falling apart. Okay. But then guys just blew stuff up. This second game, there's no excuses. It's they're they were losing guys. They were running under screens on the right people, but then the third or fourth pass was just a guy standing on the three-point line left alone. And it was over and over and over again. Unfortunately, like you, we talked about it a little bit right before we recorded, you live with that with Hawkins. He's a rookie. He's small. Defense is something he's going to have to learn to mold to in the NBA. But he's a shooter, and he's the only one you got. Roll with it. Jose was my other like major culprit of losing guys in space. And that is just not something that historically we've seen from him so hope you hope that's rust and that that's all it is is that he's just got to work his way back in it Najee was Najee like that's all you can ever say good game or bad game Najee blew like a, a really simple layup he just didn't attack Keontae George or or was it Clarkson it was somebody who's incredibly tiny in front of him and he like spun around he could have just left the ball for Dyson to lay up with no contest whatsoever and instead he like spun around and laid it up backwards and missed uh and then he scored 9 points <laughs> cuz sure 9 9 straight points right afterward yeah that it was like the kind of, it was the Najee and starters lineup late in the second half that kind of got them back into that game and yeah. they they came out just looking no energy whatsoever the, for like the first one and a half quarters of, of Monday's game, at least um, yeah. as it relates to the lack of outside shooting uh, Pelicans, I guess they shot seven of 22 jazz won 17 of 48 Dyson Daniel struggles were unfortunately pretty glaring on the offensive end in both of these Utah games. I thought Saturday was kind of a perfect encapsulation of, of what Dyson is as a player right now. He had six deals in the first half of Saturday's game. Dyson leads the entire NBA in deflections. Guy is just a defensive monster, specifically at the point of attack. I think there's a case be made, and this is strictly on ball. I think there's a case be made that Dyson is the Pelicans' single best on ball defender. I think Herb Jones is the Pelicans' best overall defender. I think Herb Jones is certainly the Pelicans' best off ball defender. Herb Jones is a very talented on ball defender. There's at least a case be made, and I'm not going to make it here, that Dyson is the best the Pelicans best on ball defender, but he has a long ways to go on the offensive end. Three of 14 on Saturday, uh, one of six on Monday. There were two plays in the fourth quarter where his guy was just completely ignoring him, shading heavily over to Zion. Zion basically has three guys on him. You know, all these guys are bunched up near the free throw line. He makes a dribble and makes the right play, just passes to Dyson. Dyson misses both of those shots. That is just a killer for your offense when they can Tony Allen you, you know? I mean, like when they just completely ignore you and sell it to stop the best guy and the best guy makes the right play and you just miss multiple times. Like that's just a killer. I am a huge fan of Dyson's game. I think he can think the game. I love what he does defensively, um, not only on ball, but he even gives you like some rim protection. I think he plays hard, but if he's going to be this bad on offense, it's, kind of untenable at least at least as a starter at least as a starter like he's just you you just can't survive games like this from one of your starting guards so there are certain memorable defenses for pelicans fans 
um, when playing against other teams. Cause like our, our history is fairly short and not full of, uh, of a lot of positive wrinkles, but there are a few. Um, and one of them from the pre AD trade era is a, a game right after the LeBron move to the Lakers where Lonzo ball is dared by the Pelicans to shoot every single three that he could ever want. He shoots 10 plus and he made two. They dared him to shoot all night, and he willingly took all the looks, and he missed them all, and the Pelicans won that game. Pelicans did this again in 2018 in the playoffs against the Trailblazers. Their coverages were all about taking the ball out of Damian Lillard's hands and letting Evan Turner and Al Farouk Aminu have as many shots as they want. Your coverage was shading everywhere else. You were not letting Nurkic get an advantage in the paint. You were getting the ball out of Dame's hands and you were not letting CJ McCollum take shots. Everybody else all day, Al Farouk Aminu, Evan Turner missed like every single goddamn shot they were given. Actually, Aminu, he hit a few, but it wasn't enough to change the game because it wasn't, he can't hit him at a 40% clip. Dyson just got dared to do the same. In that, that the coverage in that game was pretty damn simple. Cover Hawkins, deal with BI and Zion, double them. Dyson, shoot, win the game, score 30, have fun. He took the shots. Unfortunately, you asked me last podcast if there was something that I thought might be fake about that lineup or something I might be concerned about. And the thing we talked about was that Dyson's jumper was potentially still, still suspect. We are just proved correct that it is. Um, he's not confident in it. the the loading Low, he starts a shot from very, very low, brings it up over his head. It's just, it doesn't look like a shooter shot and it comes out of his hand different every time. The, the mechanics don't look consistent enough yet. You know, he's spent a lot of time with Fred fine tuning that they don't look consistent enough yet. Still really struggling from the free throw line. 65% last year is at 63% right now. I mean, free throw line is a pretty good indicator. You know, like if you're in the sixties as a guard, that's just not great, Bob. Um, you know, like if, if he could just get that floater that he flashed against Minnesota, like make that reliably, I think that would go a long way for his game. I think that would be a huge deal from him, but I don't know if he can do that reliably yet. He's just a very limited offensive player. I mean, and I think he's a guy who, when he's not surrounded by a lot of, you know, like offensive talent and star power is going to look a lot worse. Like he's just basically his value as an offensive player is kind of a connector basically like can get the ball where it needs to go put the ball on the floor a little bit but like not a great pure point guard or anything can turn the ball over when you really pressure him um but yeah man he's just a he's just a very limited offensive player and i i love what that starting five gave for the pelicans i think it was the right move i mean obviously to, to roll with it while cj was out but i mean i think the answer to who you should start when CJ returns and then CJ could return Wednesday uh, against the Sixers. He could be back Friday against the Bulls. It'll be one of those two games. I think the answer is clear. I mean, like you, you got to have CJ in the starting lineup. Yeah. So I, I think I probably, when I texted you about this conversation, this is one of those things where like I live on Twitter and you don't, um, people were already doing the, the CJ needs to just understand as a veteran and take a back seat, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm like, you guys are talking about him. Like he's Carmelo or Russ. Like he's, he's not of value. And I just, I felt the need to remind everybody that if you go look in the stat leader columns of the first five games of which they won four, CJ McCollum carried them to victory four out of five times when everybody else was still figuring shit out. And he looked like a perfect complimentary player. He was not the point of attack guy. He was not on the ball all game long. He he pick and rolled people to death and he took open shots and made them. He looked like a guy that I would want as my third offensive option next to B.I. and Zion. He looked perfect. He looked literally perfect. Sure, are you going to live with defensive deficiencies? Yeah. But the idea that a 20-year-old in six games is going to supplant a 30 plus year old with a decade in the league who's the president of the players association and has a decade of goodwill and stats telling you that he deserves to start. I just kind of laugh it away. Like I don't care if they're plus 43. I don't care if they're plus 600. It's six games from a 20 year old who has never proven to you that he can shoot. And you're like, well, but the turnovers and everything you cannot 
with BI and Zion. Like, what do we talk about? What were we talking about just last year? At the end of last year, everybody's like, Trey's going to have to start next year. Going to have to figure that out. Got to figure out how to get more shooting into that starting lineup. And we dream of lineups of like Trey, Hawk, CJ with BI and Zion and what that could look like because it should look great for everybody offensively. But in the positive side of the last, you know, I guess we got to rewind a little bit because these jazz games were terrible. But in the four prior, the positive thing that happened there was not Dyson coming into the lineup. The main takeaway was not Dyson came into the lineup and now they're good. Your top two players decided to play ball together and decided to try to play defense and rebound. It is the most important thing in this franchise. It is the number one topic last year coming into this year is the most important topic today, tomorrow, through Sunday, through the end of the season. Not Dyson getting into the lineup. Your two best players decided to be your two best players. It does not matter whether it's Dyson or CJ and CJ and Trey have proven for a longer period of time that they deserve to get to play with this version of those two. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. If you're looking for, well, what was the main reason, you know, things got a little bit better after the five game losing streak. I think they've gone five and three since then. The number one thing is Zion and BI look like they're on the same page and they're bought in and they're playing better and harder than they did at the beginning of the season. That's been the biggest change. Uh, I do think like there was kind of a, a spark with the the starting five that they were using with Dyson and Herb next to them. Um, like when CJ's out, you know, like I, I get it, like continue rolling with it. Uh, the one thing I'll say about that lineup is they're very reliant on turning other teams over and getting out in transition. And I think that can be effective for them, but also that's a hard way to live. Like the Pelicans should try to do that all the time, but like, it's hard to depend on that night in and night out to the to the degree which I think that lineup needs to. Um, so, yeah, I think you know I think we'll see CJ be back in the starting lineup, um, and I I think that makes sense to me. Uh, I still like Dyson. I think he should be in the rotation. You know, he's like versatile. He can play in a lot of different lineup combinations, but it's got to be CJ back in there. And I think you're right that. It's just Zion and Bi playing better. Like the, the the game um, right before they left on the road trip, where you know, they kind of clenched it with the the handoff with Zion and Bi. It's like how few of those moments have we gotten over the years of like, oh my god, two man game between the Pelicans, two best players in a in a critical moment. Like I love seeing that. I want to continue seeing seeing more of that. Like I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have been mad at all if they'd gone to like a B.I. Zion pick and roll with Hawkins on the strong side at the end of the game against Utah or something like that. But like, yeah. I, I definitely want to see more of it, please. I think they they went with something they trusted more, which was Zion to just go press space and create out of it. So I get why they do like we know that pick and roll is not polished yet. They've run it like 10 times total. So, I you know, I get that not being the reliable closing play, but. The reason, like, as much as people get frustrated with Willie, Willie manages with a long-term view. Willie puts out lineups and uses guys in roles with a view to the future of, like, what is this team going to be and what do I need it to be? And that's why he doesn't swing when, like, the analytics say, do this, take this guy out. Willie's always going to take his time with that because his goals are farther down. And in this case, like, this is that's one of those things. Like, even if you're going to lose the game, you need to keep putting this in B.I. and Zion's hands because your future is them being able to close it down on on great teams with them to with the with the ball in their hands. So they need to be able to close down the jazz in Utah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I think the Pelicans, it's a little bit complicated finding the right fit around their best two players who are very talented and I you know, I'm optimistic they can figure it out this year, but I think it is a little bit tricky because it's like neither of them are going to guard the other team's best player almost ever. Uh, neither of them are really going to take threes. Um, I've harped on that a lot with, with Brandon specifically, and neither of them are like great defensive rebounders. It's like, man, there's kind of, there's kind of just like a lot of holes there. Like I wish they complemented each other a little bit better. You know, like I wish, Brandon would take more threes and Zion was uh, the state of your, he defended like he did a Duke, you know, it's like, <laughs> I think things would be a lot different, but it's like, you know, there are 
they both do have some deficiencies and they have some of the same deficiencies. But one of the exciting things about this little stretch right before the jazz, we saw a glimpse of hope of both of those guys doing those things. Yeah. Yeah, we saw it be possible. We saw Bi fight and and Zion fighting for rebounds, and basically the biggest plays of the closer games against the Kings, and especially the most famous photo so far this year that I was like waiting for two days for the high res version to come out. Zion stealing the ball from James Harden, leaving him on his ass, shocked as oh, if the world man. had changed. That I just you saw you've seen little glimpses of Zion doing the Duke bully ball. It, it's basically like carbon copy of what he did to Kevin Knox in the summer league. When we first saw him, when the, when the earthquake happened and the world split in two, we, we literally saw mirror images of that in two of these games. And we saw it a good bit. We saw him jump on Luca and get a steal in a crucial moment. We've started to see him ratchet up. But the thing is, the thing that sucked is like, we kind of saw a regression in this Utah game in the second Utah game. Post you saw both of them kind of go back to the things that were the bad habits and the stuff that you don't want. Post team meeting, Zion's averaging 26 points a game, 59% shooting, seven and a half free throws, uh, almost six assists. That's that's pretty much in line with the Zion of last year before he got hurt, uh, the Zion of Stan Van Gundy, you know, like Zion and his rookie year. Like that's my point is basically post team meeting, this is kind of the Zion we know and and expect the the production from. Um, so, you know, it took him kind of till December last year to really get ramped up. Hopefully this is him being ramped up. Um, I mean, I thought overall he, I thought Zion had a pretty good game against the second one in Utah. I mean, I think he really did a lot of heavy lifting on, on offense for the most part. Um, I mean, yeah, cause just, we didn't make a, we didn't make a goddamn thing to support him. <laughs> yeah. um, the only thing that I thought was unfortunate was that, part of the luxury of having BI and Zion against playing against a lineup they should beat um, without Lori Markin in. You don't want to see either one of them erased for an entire quarter. And in both of the, in that game, you saw both of them get erased from the game for a quarter. It wasn't the same quarter, but it, they both disappeared for an entire quarter and that can't happen with those two. Um, that's you're supposed to be able to stagger and talent your way through. And this is like the up the upper tier expectation for them, right? That even though we lose all the shooting and all that, like great teams lose guys all the time. You get hit with stuff and you change things up. And at the end of the day, star power carries you out of these kinds of matchups and star power should have carried you out of this. And unfortunately it didn't, it came up a bucket short. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and honestly, like, they probably win the game if Matt Ryan's healthy. Like it's it's it can yeah. be that simple because oh, yeah. they didn't I, I tweeted that during the game. I was like, they like, couldn't even like injury gods couldn't even let Matt Ryan stay healthy. Like I was that's that's where we're at right now. It's like you're watching these games and it's like we can't even get like like imagine that final play, but with like Matt Ryan instead of Najee, strictly for just shooting purposes, you know, and floor yeah. spacing purposes. And maybe you think it he is gets three defenders. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe it is a different outcome if it's just you know, Matt Ryan instead of Najee. The the good news is I think all three of those guys, Pelican shooters who've been out are going to be back pretty soon. Uh, CJ is probably going to be back this week. Trey Murphy, I was told, um, you know, maybe, maybe this weekend, but probably early next week. We don't know the Pelican schedule yet because of the old in-season tournament. And Matt Ryan upgraded to Doubtful along with Trey for the first time. Um, so it seems like they're going to get all these guys back. I'm really curious. I mean, Willie Green's going to have some hard decisions to make rotationally, uh, assuming, you know, the Pelicans do get fully healthy and can stay fully healthy for a while. Why do you um, even have to throw that part in there? Why do you have to do that? We're right here. We're oh, all on. done. We're on the cusp. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. So we're on the cusp. One of my notes from the the Utah series or whatever. It's like it. The lineups with Hawkins and Jose Alvarado. They just look small to me. And I think when you introduce CJ McCollum back in there, if the Pelicans play nine or 10 guys, I think it's just going to be hard to play three smaller guys. Like the Pelicans, they do not want to play small. You know, like they, they want to play big. They want to switch. They want to turn you over. They want to get out and transition. Being big is a big part of that. Um, I, I think it's going to be difficult for them to play three small guards in the rotation. And then the backup center spot too. Um, I think to this point in the season, 
unquestionably Cody Zeller has been the Pelicans' best backup center. We've some, seen some Larry and some Cody, but it is clear to me, kind of no matter who you're playing, that the Cody Zeller is your best option at backup center right now. He's giving you some of the most um, bankable rebounding of anybody on the team right now. He just get he gets positions on guys like he knows where to be, and he's fighting his ass off, even though he's going to give some fouls up and stuff. It's veteran stuff. Like he knows if he can't get there and he needs to throw an elbow or something. Like you're not mad at anything Cody Zeller does. He is playing within his role exactly how you would ask him to. Um, look, this is the biggest reason that I'm not like. If you if you think this team is a 45 win team, then they got to lose a ton of games. They, like <laughs> if you, if you think they're if you think they're going to be a 45 win team, you got to watch like 20 more of these happen. Like you know, I can't get that upset over over you know either game. The frustrating part is that they lost both games different ways. Like Zion comes back and you're like hoping they could just power their way through the second one, and they're just so messy. And it, it was probably Honestly, it was probably the worst two-way game they've played with with Bi and Zion available, um, and that was frustrating because we've we're used to offensive droughts. We're not used to them giving up the looks they gave up all night. Because honestly, the Jazz could have run away with that in the first half. There's they. It wasn't like oh they played great defense and then they didn't. They played awful defense all night, and Jordan Clarkson and Taylor Horton Tucker missed shots, and then they didn't, and you know, that's, that's when your game gets, gets like it did. Um, Jordan Clarkson being the main culprit there and Keontae George was just great throughout, but I can't really be that mad even at what I just saw because there was no shooting. And you just told me that we have three shooters on the cusp of coming back. We're about to be looking at four shooters. So of the guys you just called out, the natural role for one of them, like Jordan Hawkins is not supposed to be playing 28 minutes a game. That has been a desperation thing because he is an absolute animal with a trigger and we haven't had guys. Give me the 6'8 guy who's pretty goddamn buff and can leap out the building and Trey Murphy in that spot. And I feel pretty goddamn good about it. And so all be- of a sudden you get him and CJ back. Like I honestly think like, You will just see people that are getting exposed because of size. I think you'll just see them fall into the role they're supposed to be in. I don't. I don't think you can take Hawkins out of the rotation with the way he's shooting now. No, I mean, I just Just bump him down. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think he. You can afford to take him out of the rotation with how well he's playing right now. Like uh, I I tweeted before Monday's Utah game, like the NBA rookie three point leaderboard. I think Hawkins was at forty seven. I believe the next closest rookie was. Chat at like 29. Yeah, it was like in the 20s. Yeah. Like, it, I mean, just a ridiculous difference. A couple of people are pointing out, well, maybe Jordan could even challenge like Keegan Murray's um, rookie three-point record, which he set last year of 206. Probably not because I don't think Jordan's going to be, like, he's not going to be getting many starts, I don't think, for the rest of the year unless things go horribly wrong. Like, it's just, it'll be mo- mostly due to like a playing time thing. Um, but whatever. I mean, the guy is balling right now electric offensive player knows exactly who he is more than just a shooter too. keep saying that he's a scorer, man. Yeah. Like, he might not have like athleticism that like pops off the screen, but this may be weird to say some sneaky athleticism. Like he's quick. He's smooth. Lunch pail guy. Yeah. A little bit of a lunch pail guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a, he's a, a, a gritty first one in first one out. Look, he's a he's a three level scorer who's twenty pounds too light. That's all. Like he's a three level scorer that can't finish at the rim because he's light. And if he adds, you know, some lower body strength or just a little bit of creativity with the timing of his attack, like that's it. He's a three level scorer. Like yeah, that's he's, that's he's what a it scorer. is. He's a scorer. I think we've seen enough to say like he's a scorer, not just a shooter. So I, I love what I'm seeing from him. I don't know. I mean, for for nine and nine. Right now, with all the guys who have missed time, I feel okay about that. Um, I mean, the the biggest development has been Brandon and Zion playing better after that team meeting and guys saying the right things and doing some of the right things too. I mean, I think CJ said on his podcast, he's like, we've got good complimentary players. It's not going to matter unless these two guys are working in sync, you know, if they're not completely bought in, basically. And yeah, man, I mean, a lot of it just depends on your on your best two players. Like, I, I hold those guys to a really high standard, which I think is deserved. 
you should hold max players in the NBA to a high standard. Like, like I kind of view them as like, you know, CEOs of a fortune 500 company. And it's like, yeah, man, you are paid to perform at a high level. Like that's to quote Don Draper. That's what the money's for. Look, they, I think we, we have a lot of good problems. You know, when guys get back in the lineup, the problems that we're talking about, they're good problems. I am going to get really frustrated if the ones that have clearly revealed themselves, like if the real problems don't subside, like if guys have inherited roles because of past performance and not because of this year, if they get treated like the final two years of Lakers Kobe because of stuff they did, you know, in last year or in in the year prior leading up to the Phoenix series, I'm going to be frustrated. Because Who could have predicted that the backup center fight would be, would fire you up so much. Who could have predicted it's this? Just, <laughs> I don't want to be this guy. I really don't. I have been an ardent Willie lineup defender for the entire life of this podcast. But when you see a guy hurting the team every time he's out there and it's so visible, like, Here's the difference when I when I say I'm frustrated with Jose versus being frustrated with Larry Nance. When I'm frustrated with Jose, it's because I'm seeing him be bad in ways that I have not seen him be bad before. And he has a size disadvantage. So Jose kind of has to be perfect. He has to be the hustle rat on defense that gets over every single screen and is always yeah, you like that? Hustle, hustle rat. rat. <laughs> <laughs> he gets he gets over every screen. He contests every shot. He's up in your grill. He's making your life an absolute misery and Jose is missing rotations on guys. Jose is not getting over screens. He just looks like a mess and it's probably because he just got back. And honestly, because of his size, he should probably never play over 20 minutes in the NBA anyway. Like see Tyus Jones in Washington. There are some guys that are great as backup point guards that should not ever be more than that because of a disadvantage that they can't get. Whereas I look at Hawkins and I'm like, Trim in his minutes is just going to mean he's not exposed defensively as much. And that dude can get off nine shots in 12 minutes. I got no problem with that guy. Like he's a flamethrower. You could put him out there for a shorter stint and still get the 15 points out of him. But when I look at Larry, my problem isn't Larry being out of position or, you know, anything like that. It's not like he's blowing the defense because he's making a mistake. He's getting out competed by backups. He's getting priority treatment. And I don't, I don't, I just don't see it. I don't see a single minute. Out I think I've seen. Well, let, priority me treatment. let me ask you this. Yeah. Outcompeted or outplayed? Cause there's a difference to me. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's go with outplayed as a better word because out, I'm sure he's trying his ass off. Yeah. Like I, I'm, I'm a, sure he's fighting his ass off. To me, it's, sure not, it's not an effort. effort it's thing. not a matter of yeah, effort. Okay. It's a matter of. He's a little undersized for that position and Good physically he just doesn't look right to me. You know, I just, I look at him at, and at the totality of his career and I see a, a career backup big who had enough athleticism and a great mind to time jumps outwork guys. And he just out hustle all your backups. He was a premium backup. And 18 to 25 minutes, especially like you could press him into the starting lineup sometimes and survive it because he's just a smart dude who works his ass off. He did not have the athletic gifts to be able to have a lot of room for error. And he's capitalized on that his entire career. Now he's racked up so many injuries that you're watching him struggle to compete with Simone Fontecchio, who before like a week ago, I didn't even know who he was. And like, it's just Fontecchio. Uh, it, you know, it sounds like a nice cheese. I just, he can't, he can't do it anymore. And I would love to say that it's like a specific injury that is ongoing, but he just got back off a recovery timeline and rehab. This is just kind of the miles. So that's the part that's tough. And the if fact just... that he was so bad and then he got another run in a one possession game. Yeah, if, you, if you just look at all, like Google all the injuries that Larry Nance Jr. has like accrued in his career, it is a lot. Like he's just dealt with a lot of injuries. Like there's just been a lot of wear and tear in that body. Uh, before we get out of here, I want to finish up on this. Uh, Zion has sat three back-to-back -back so far, Detroit, Minnesota, Utah. Um, 
There's another back-to-back this weekend. It's a, a home against San Antonio on the road against Chicago. I would bet, I would bet that he probably sits that one. Um, I wanted to just get your thoughts on this. Like I, the Detroit one kind of frustrated me a little bit because it was the fifth game of the season. It was like so early. I'm like, how can this guy be redlining right now? I haven't felt as strongly about the last two. Where do you come down on Zion sitting back to backs? I think the Pelicans have nine more this year. If I'm correct, I would have to double check that. This is my opinion. I am not an investigative journalist. Um, I am not, you know, I'm not sitting with the team like you are. I, this is informed by nothing other than me and what I've heard and read to this point and what we've talked about. I think Zion's conditioning was terrible coming into the season. I don't think that's debatable. I think that was very, very visible basically until the Clippers game. Um, unfortunately, think, that's like an objective fact. I mean, yeah, it's just, you yeah. just like watch him in the first half of every game. By the end of the first quarter, the dude's red in the face and it's it, that that's hard to tell. He like he looks like he is blowing air eight minutes in the dude is just done in uh you know in pro wrestling you call that you call that blowing up and you know pro wrestling's got a lot of white guys in it so they turn red in the face and they look like a they look like a balloon that's about to pop um so he looked like he was blowing up in every single first half and then you'd see it in the second half because the effort would fall away and then he'd like muster it up for like the final you know the final possessions of the fourth quarter and maybe that was enough but like he's clearly been dealing with conditioning issues so far this entire season. The last few games have been the first time that I have seen him not have major conditioning effects affect his second halves. So I am of the opinion that when his conditioning suggests that he can play back to backs, he will. I think we, you're probably right. He probably does miss the next one. I do not think that this is going to be because like, I I think everything we heard in the off season and heard leading up to the season, I I think everybody knows that this is a make it or break it thing. I think the NBA has punted the load management concept. I don't believe that they are just holding him out of back-to-backs because the science says so. I think he looked like shit coming into the season from a conditioning standpoint, and they want to feel good about when they do pull the trigger, that they're not blowing up this long-term investment. Who's on this wild max contract. And as soon as he looks like he's getting through whole games without a problem, then I think he'll just start to play back-to-backs and it'll be a non-factor. I understand why the question's there. There's no reason for it not to be. Like right now, it looks like systemic sitting. I feel like once his conditioning's there, he's going to play. Okay. Okay. Um, last year when he, when he hurt his hamstring, that was a three games and four nights scenario. The Pelicans played on January 30th, 31st. They had New Year's Day off and then they played... January 2nd against the Sixers. That was when Zion hurt his hamstring. I honestly, I have not gotten like a great explanation of, of why he sat back to back so far. You know, I'm just kind of relying on what, like Willie said on the record. Um, after he, he set the Minnesota one, Willie was basically like, Willie basically suggested that this was Zion's decision. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't really had an issue with him sitting the last two ones. Um, he does look pretty heavy to me right now. I mean, hopefully he can just continue to play his, his way into shape. And I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable to me. They can be this good, you know, so far away from peak conditioning level is like the nicest way I could put it. I mean, like, you know, ever since the team meeting, like it really has just been Zion special again. I mean, the Clippers game, ridiculous, uh, putting James Harden on the floor, you know, I, that, that delighted me. I thought he was excellent you know, for the most part against Utah on Monday, hell of a player, man. I hope he figures it out. I'm starting to set my expectations a little differently. Like I'm just looking at him as like late phase Shaq. Like, I I think this is going to be a thing every year. I think it's, I think, and just to like to not to vilify him a little bit less on like the care he takes with his body. I I think this is hard. I think he's, it's a one of one top 1% of the world combination of athleticism and size i think this is a hard thing to do like and we kind of heard like everything we've heard from k that you and i've talked about before kind of suggests that like only playing live hardcore basketball is like the thing that's gonna get him there so i think this is to a degree like we're gonna be dealing with this all the time you don't you don't think he's at home doing the peloton well hey maybe now so like quick reference to cj's podcast cj came back and did a podcast 
let the world know that his uh, his daughter had been born. Congrats to CJ on the birth of his daughter. Um, but in that podcast, also shared with us kind of what he'd been going through with his rehab and like what it looks like for him to return. And he also shined a little light on the meeting. And then he shined a little light on like where he's at with Zion. And look, this is a different year for Zion relative to past years in terms of his interactions with the team and in terms of like who's deciding how he goes about what. This is the first time that we have ever had a Zion that sounds like he is really interacting with the team and listening to kind of anybody. And it did like it was frustrating to hear that it felt like CJ apparently like needed to tell Zion even now in the year of our Lord 2023 that his off day doesn't mean it's a complete off day and that he can't he can just sit on the couch that like he needs to also work out on his off days. It sounds like CJ has had a lot to say about what Zion's training regimen needs to be when he is not at the team facility, which is the battle. Hopefully, that is landing when somebody is not chirping in his ear and, you know, he'll retain some of this and come a little bit better prepared. But I still think it's just an enormous challenge with that body, with that, just that equation that he's trying to, that needle he's trying to thread every year. I think this is always going to be a challenge. And in general, like he's had a lot of injuries and stuff that have been self-induced and been about size, body conditioning, all that stuff. But it's, it's, it's just going to be tough. Like he just needs to play basketball year round. That dude can't take a month off from playing five on five. Like he just needs to do it all the time. And we just got to hope that that doesn't mean a, a blown ACL or anything. Let me end with a little positivity. Once the Pelicans get past this game against the Sixers on Wednesday, it is a very manageable schedule in December for pretty much the entire month at a time when they're finally getting completely healthy. I feel like there's a chance for the Pelicans to make some hay here in December. You know, they're kind of, they're at 500. These injuries look like they're about to be in the rear view mirror. They're going to be healthy. I think like December is the time to make some hay. And if they're not, if they're not a few games above 500 at the end of December, that I think that's when we'll know there's probably something wrong here. Like there is a chance to, to win some games here. Like this should, this should be a winning record in the month of December. Strength of schedule to this point. Second in the NBA. So nine and nine with all these injuries, you know, it does, it does bode well from here. I think they have like the third or fourth easiest schedule the rest of the way. So like, look, that stretch where they won games, like here's the weird part that stretch from hell at home that they should have lost a bunch of games. They, they won them all. And then they lost the Utah jazz twice. So in typical Pelicans fashion, none of this makes any sense. You have no idea what to do with any of this, and everything's conflicting. And if you're not paying really close attention, you have no idea what's going on. So, you know, you got to hope for the best at this point. Like this, at the end of the day, the sum of all of this, good shooters are coming back. Veteran players are coming back. Spacing and shooting is good for Zion and BI, and they have played harder for the last eight games than they had the prior 10. So it should, like if this was civil court, the preponderance of the evidence suggests that they will be good and very good. The preponderance of the evidence, though, if we went to federal trial, we, it's a shit storm. The team meeting the Pelicans had went better than the team meeting the Chicago Bulls had. I'll just say that. Some positive Yikes. coming from the team meeting the Pelicans in. All right, Adam, I'm going to go swing my Chuck Norris kettlebell. I'm going to get that in. And I'm going to eat, and then I'm going to see if the Pelicans make the quarterfinals of the in-season tournament. It was you really fired up about that, the old IST. I'm fired up about the IST. That sounds a little bit like an STD, but yes, I'm fired up about it. There's still a chance they can play one more game on a purple court. We'll find out tonight. Thanks for doing this, buddy. We will uh, huddle up and do this again next week. Until next time.